My name is Professor Rod Broughtest. I'm a professor of criminology at the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Professor Peter Spirenberg, formerly from the Univ Erasmus University in the Netherlands, and currently visiting Australia, uh, delivering a series of talks on the very current topic of uh, violence. Um, maybe, uh, Professor Spirenberg, if I can start by asking you a pretty basic question. Do you think we've become more or less violent uh, than we were in the past? Uh, first of all, Professor Broadhurst, thank you for inviting me to speak here at ANU. Uh, are we becoming less or more violent? Many people would think we're becoming more violent, but uh, the evidence really shows that we have become less violent, perhaps not all countries, but at least in, in, we know much about European history, for example, about murders, uh, and less so in North America. And we know that they have declined very much in terms of rates per 100,000 per year from the Middle Ages up to the present. Yeah, that decline, I mean, I, I notice is, uh, at least in the published research, which, which there are actually a considerable amount of study now, shows that that decline has gone from as high as 70 to 80 per 100,000 down to one to two per 100,000. I mean, it's a massive decline. What do you think drove that decline? What, why, why has interpersonal violence, particularly homicide, fallen so dramatically? Uh, and indeed, it's been fairly stable now for over 100 years in terms of that lower rate, at least in Western Europe. Well, I think it confirms uh, the theory of uh, Norbert Elias, uh, a theory that I have worked with over the decades. Mm. Uh, and which talks about the process of civilization. So not civilization as something static, but a process that again is driven by the uh, increasing stability and growth of, of states, the so-called state formation processes. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to reflect a little bit on the inference of Elias on your work, I mean, one of the you know significant achievements I think of Elias is that he did lay out some of the very basic drivers of what we would uh, see as contributing to the decline in violence. One, as you mentioned, this the state formation, the monopolization of violence. But he also made a great play about the role of, uh, if you like, commerce, of interdependence. The fact that we had long, what he called longer chains of interdependence was one way of reducing the, if you like, the fear of others. And the other one he mentioned, uh, which you touch on quite a bit in your own work, is this sensitization to violence, this process in which we, our attitudes or our response to violence becomes much more constrained. We've, we, we're much more shameful and we find much more repugnant the spilling, spilling of blood, the suffering of other human beings. So can, could you tell me a little bit more about you know, how, that, that, how those Elysian notions, if I like, have influenced your own work? Uh, yes. Uh I think you have already uh, very uh, neatly uh, summarized uh, some of his uh, theories, mm. but I think the key word here is interdependence. So it's not one developments in one field like the economic field, which are driving mm. all other social changes, but mm. it is uh, changes in one field uh, affect the other field, like with processes of state formation mm. and economic development, they reinforce each other. If, uh, if in the early, uh, for early on mm. in, in the high Middle Ages, uh, a powerful prince, the king of France, for example, would be able to be, would be, is able to beat a few rivals. Mm. Uh, but if there are no lines of communication mm. and there's little trade going on between these uh, areas that he has conquered, then this early monopoly falls down again. Mm. So it, it's, in the end, it's economic development and state formation reinforce each other. And that again has a, uh, has a consequence for people's habitus, as Elias calls it. So it's not only people's violent inclinations that uh, become tamed, as it were, but mm. it's, it's the whole psychology of, of humans that, that is changing in the end. Yeah, that's a mm -hmm. wonderful insight of Elias. It's he mm -hmm. really pointed the fact that it's our interior, our psychic, what he would have called our mm -hmm. relationship between our psychogenesis mm -hmm. and our sociogenesis, that this change mm -hmm. affected us in the way in our eternal thoughts. And I think mm -hmm. if I'm mm 
if I'm right, I might be pushing it a little bit. It, it was really talking about a capacity to empathize, an ability to see others mm -hmm. as you would see yourself, so that suffering in another had a, mm -hmm. you know, had an impact on, on our sort of inner feelings and so on. Yeah, one of the concomitant processes mm -hmm. is an increasing ability uh, of identification that people increasingly, not only that mm. the identification with people that you know very well yeah. uh, around you increases, but that in increasingly also people are able or they, they tend to identify with others far away as humans. And that, for example, uh, influences uh, people's attitudes towards genocide or massacres. It's, it's a very recent mm. phenomenon that mm. massacres Wherever, wherever they occur in the world, they they tend to uh, they tend to get noticed, noted, and revealed, and people feeling uh, revulsion against what is happening. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned because because the other side of the coin in in, in, in lethal violence studies and homicide mm -hmm. studies is we talk about. I know it sounds rather sort of uh, insensitive. We talk about ordinary ordinary mm -hmm. homicides. That's mm -hmm. homicides that pl policing agencies in our states d deal with mm -hmm. commonly. Mm -hmm. But the other side of the coin is that we also uh, a homicide also involves mega murders or massacres mm -hmm. or mass murders, genocide. You mentioned mm -hmm. being perhaps one of the more extreme kinds of crimes or atrocities that take place. What do we know about? Um, I mean, we can we can demonstrate clearly that at least in Western Europe and many other countries. Interpersonal violence, homicides decline very, very dramatically. What can we say about the frequency, uh, if you like, or the common, the commonness of mass atrocities, mass mass murders, and so on? You know, what 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 do we know about what those trends are? Well, we have not the kind of precise statistical evidence that we have for homicides, so mm. it's much less of a thing that we that we can make precise measurements of mass murder or genocide. Mm. Um, it used to be believed by many people, also by many scholars, that mm. recent periods, say the last 150 years, are the most violent in history, especially when you examine massacres and genocide. Uh, and But that was mainly the impression raised in general studies of mm. uh, genocide, mm. where the beginning of the 20th century very often is also the beginning of the story. But if you dig a little deeper, mm then it's easy to uh, to find out that genocide is of all ages, even though we do not really know whether it is more or less common mm. in the mother world. Well, I mean, you're making a, you know, a, 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 a fairly strong argument to say that, of course, you know, massacres, genocide has been known to history for a long, long time, at least, I guess, since the, the, you know, the agrarian kingdoms and so on. But I, 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 I gather you're also been playing with some you know some interesting data or ideas about you know what kind of uh, societies were what how violent societies were in the if you like the paleolithic in the in the pre-literate period because it's again a kind of a controversial area where we don't have a lot of data and so judgments and uh, uh, you know opinions about that period are quite interesting from a you know the or origins of our violent nature if i can put it that way indeed of whether we really are violent well this is an area that i've become recently interested in uh, and which is research that I'm, I'm still developing mm. so I, I I can but I can say a few things uh, uh, first of all I, I depend here on scholars uh, who know a lot about genetics and and nowadays with the study of DNA we mm. can uh, we by studying DNA of present-day living populations, mm. we can mm. we know a lot about movements of population in the past, tens of uh, mm. uh, 50,000 mm. years ago, uh, but we also can speculate a bit about possible violence, and it is my hypothesis mm. that the so-called races, mm. which used to be distinguished on the earth, that in the formation of these races, there's also process, that they, these have been formed also through processes of exclusion uh, expulsion and violence. The uh, the the white skin color, mm, for example, mm, is mm. something relatively recent that perhaps arose some ten thousand years ago, independently in Western Eurasia and China. Mm, mm. And well, anyway, this is a hypothesis that I'm mm. still working on. Look, it sounds you know terrifically interesting, and of course, mm -hmm. you know, given our great mm -hmm. you know concerns and apprehension, mm -hmm. particularly now.
in the modern world and the current world when we seem to face crisis after crisis, mm -hmm. uh, small wars, if you like, atrocities, I'm thinking mm -hmm. particularly of in Syria and Iraq. I mean, how would you know, your theoretical ideas or your ideas about you know, violence, what sort of a take would you give on what's ha happening in these sorts of places mm -hmm. where we see just terrible examples of massacres and mass atrocities taking mm -hmm. place almost you know, on a daily basis? One thing, of course, that we have to uh, think of mm -hmm. is that uh, of, of the mass, the role of the mass media uh, mm -hmm. nowadays. So everything that happens anywhere in the world just is on TV and, and on the I internet. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it's for one thing, it looks as if there are more conflicts around. Mm -hmm. But another answer is that yeah, this process of gradually. Mm -hmm. Decreasing violence does not mean that it goes on and on just everywhere in the world. It just neatly uh, uh, goes in the uh, the right direction. Mm. If that it's would not, be a, not a simple linear yeah, sort no, of relationship. If that would be mm. the case, there would no need, be, no need for scholars be to study it. Everyone could just see it. Yeah. Uh, but if you speak, for example, of Syria and Iraq, mm. uh, it is also important to realize that these until 50 years ago or something. Well somewhat longer ago, but throughout the 19th century and the early 20th mm -hmm. century, uh, these areas and many others were uh, colonies of European powers. And there was also then a lot of colonial violence going on, but then mostly hidden from the public in the home country. Yeah, look, I, I, you know, I think you're really pointing to a, 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 what I think anyway is a very important sort of area of research. Mm -hmm. We know that Elias's ideas and your work in particular has extended what we know about violence using that model, if you like, or that theoretical mm -hmm. grasp in Western Europe and Europe more generally, or at least in the, if you like, in the, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But we have so little work, as you point out, right. uh, coming from Oriental or non-Western mm -hmm. sort of jurisdictions or places. I mean, my own work in Cambodia with my colleagues, uh, Terry Buhus and Bridget shows that at least in the Cambodian example, that the same kind of cascading fall in violence takes place. Mm -hmm. um, but a, it may still, I guess, be too early to argue convincingly, at least to everybody, that we might have, a, if you like, a, a series of ideas or, or thoughts about, or if you like, theories. I'm just reminded of Kant's famous diction about there's nothing more practical than a good theory. Do you think, <laughs> in that sense, that uh, it would be worth trying to extend that work into a broader comparative area? I mean, I think it's something that you've been trying to do. Oh, uh, sure. I've been trying mm. to do that. And, mm. uh, well, I'm glad that you are doing that as mm. well. So mm. we, we surely need more research. And mm. I'm looking forward to uh, read your book on Cambodia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Professor Zverenberg. Look, I, 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 I mean, I... I probably we probably should finish now. I'd love to ask more questions. The one that's sort of still bubbling up in my mind is the classic, and maybe we can finish with this. That kind of classic criticism of the the whole sort of Elysian idea of you know, the, the the in 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 his book the about manners, how manners, you know, our etiquette, our the way we behave, how that's changed over time. I'm just thinking one of the kind of criticisms that's come up quite a bit is that we often look at our forefathers, our you know, the, our, our our ancient, our middle uh, middle ages forebears, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> conceive of them as rather childlike, as rather emotional creatures, prone to extremes of violence and calm. You know, societies that you know can generate, you know, the wonderful baroque music that we hear, but at the same time we're keen on dueling and, and splitting noses and some of the other sort of, you know violent things that we've talked that you particularly talk about in your books. Uh, do you think that that's true that we do kind of over characterize or we pretend that our earlier sort of, you know, our forefathers were somehow cruder, less sophisticated, less civilized? Is that a, is that a, how would you respond to that kind of criticism? Well, you might call them less civilized, but then in a very neutral and technical sense, but mm. they were surely human beings. They lived in a different society and they behaved according, accordingly. They, they behaved to what was useful for them in that society. They often had to rely on themselves for their protection. Uh, but there's no need to, for ourselves to be pride in our mm. civilized habitus. That's just the result of us having been born in 
1948, as in my case. Mm, but mm. I guess just mm. just to sort of finish, I mean, it, it, it's clear that the process of civilization is something mm. that's ongoing or continuing. Sure. Are you optimistic about you know the future of humanity? Do you think you know the violence will the level of violence that we experience even today will continue to diminish? What might you know, what's your what's your sort of take on that, Professor Sparenberg? I would always say that it's possible, but it's not something that's automatically guaranteed. Well, thank you, Professor Sparenberg, for joining us in today's conversation. It's been a real delight, and it's been a pleasure having you <clears throat> visit us at ANU, and we look forward to having more uh, engagement with you in the future. Thank you so much. You're welcome.